thank you, Philip, um, and, and thank you, Janine and Christina, for the hard work um, in um, organising these lectures. It takes an awful lot of energy, actually, on the part of uh, Christine to put these things together. Um, and thank you all for coming. I've actually been based at St Mary's for the past 12 years, um, and my daughter, Mariam, has been twice at St Mary's, but not my partner, Stephanie. I'm actually looking for her. <laughs> uh, so I, I'm really, um, I'm, I'm so pleased she has finally actually made it to St Mary's. Uh, lifelong uh, learning has become a global issue. Uh, some universities in, in the UK and even in London, they are setting up Department of Lifelong Learning. The UN and the UNESCO have got programs uh, in lifelong learning, but they focus on numeracy and literacy, mainly in the third world. Of course, a lifelong learning is not just about numeracy and literacy. Uh, <clears throat> Our current uh, project is funded by the European Commission. So the European Commission, despite the economic um, uh, uh, crisis in Europe, is actually funding our project in Palestine, and they're strongly behind it. Um, and the project is, is designed as a co-learning project, as a knowledge sharing project. It does involve four Palestinian universities, um, and that's actually the University of Birzeit. Um, that's actually the University of Bethlehem, the second um, university. This is Al Quds University. Uh, that's Al Quds University, and this is the Islamic University of Gaza. So it actually, we've got four Palestinian partners in this project. Between them, they have got nearly 50,000 students between these four universities. And I will go more about Palestinian universities and what they do, uh, and uh, who are these. And the European partners are St. Mary's, University of Glasgow, uh, the National University of Ireland uh, in Maynooth, and University of Malta. So, got, so we have eight universities and two Palestinian NGOs involved. We've got really 10 uh, institutions involved in it, and it's a huge project funded by the uh, European uh, commission. By the way, actually, some of my publications are at the end of this room, and some of my books, I'm not flogging these books, but I'm actually flogging the journal I'm editing. Uh, Philip mentioned the journal Holy Land Studies, uh, a multidisciplinary journal published by University um, of Edinburgh. I'm actually flogging it on the cheap, just kind of a kind of special um, uh, offer. Uh, only ten, uh, ten quid. So <laughs> So just to try to promote this journal, and it's actually at the end of the room, so I, I do uh, suggest people go and have a look at it. Um, I, I also, I want to talk, uh, to talk about a number of things. Uh, one is the achievements of the Universities of Palestine. This is actually something that people know very little about. What exactly the Universities of Palestine are doing? There's so much coverage on Palestine, but in fact, the, the focus of this lecture is on the achievements of the Universities of Palestine. And also, I've got some good news from Palestine, not just bad news, if you like. Um, in the mid-90s, I taught uh, at BZ universities. Um, and even then I could recognize BZ University as a major center of learning. Even then the university was becoming an important university, not just in Palestine, but also uh, in the Middle East. And I also want to talk about actually the, um, the pedagogies of Paolo Freire and of Edward Said, two well-known well -known guys. Uh, I just want to kind of... Uh, remind you about them. So basically, I'm actually trying to cover a number of things here, and including um, talking about Edward Said. I knew Edward personally in the last 10 years of his life when he was already suffering from leukemia, which is, was a very tough period in his life. But we did show a number of conferences, and I went to him and I said, would you like to serve on the journal I'm editing? And he said, are you kidding? Uh, I'm getting 70 requests a day. Um, uh, of course, he was always generous, and he became a member of the International Board of the Journal uh, we set up. Um, so I want to say something about a, a friend um, and, and someone with an enduring uh, legacy. Um, uh, now, <coughs> the, 
the two guys actually were famous and were what Edward actually described as public intellectuals. So they are, they be, at one point actually they became celebrities uh, uh, and uh, they, they also publish uh, books which also were translated into many languages. So they are, in a way, they, they don't need to be introduced. But I want to say something specifically about their relevance to lifelong learning in Palestine and um, uh, the way I'm actually going to try to use them. In what way, what are the key values of lifelong learning? And is there any place for it in the contemporary uh, university? In the literature, lifelong learning is associated with adult education, adult education. And um, in the 20th century, it became associated with the workplace and the factories in the post-Bolshevik revolution, the, the Bolsheviks actually made a huge uh, issue out of it, and, and they said, or they, they proclaimed, they wanted to educate the workers in the factories. So this was one of their famous slogans. But lifelong learning is also, is also familiar from um, our economies here, if you like, capitalist economies. It was always associated with training, with retraining, with professional development, and generally with acquiring practical skills, in improving employability, professional development. So it has a kind of a distinct practical flavor, if you like. And of course, with the, with the technological revolution, with the rise of the internet, uh, lifelong learning has become even more popularized uh, further. I actually share a vision of lifelong learning as something from cradle to grave, if you like. In Arabic, we call it Ta'lim Muslimir or Ta'lim Mad al And it's really from, from almost you know, age zero to, uh, to kind of, if you like, end of life. It's formal and informal. Uh, the, 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 I think the, the key value underpinning it is, is the idea of it's a human right. And it's also guaranteed, human rights guaranteed under UN conventions and the, the European Conventions on Human Rights. Uh, and, and that's a fundamental thing to begin with, that the right to education is a human right, and human right um, derived from the idea that we are all born free, we are equal in dignity, and we are entitled to education. Um, and the purpose of it is to try to foster people's capacity to engage with the real world and to try to influence and transform their environment. Um, lifelong learning is about actually their life cycles, about responding to changing life cycles. It's, a, it's Im embedded in the idea that people can become productive, uh, have a, meaning uh, me a meaningful life, independent. It, it, it's about learning with and uh, learning uh, from. It's about the mul multiple purposes of learning. It's about the life-wide dimensions of learning. It's about uh, opening up new opportunities. It's about something which we, we, we say you, you never close down things. Um, of course, universities are still the primary uh, creator and disseminators of knowledge. But today, we know there are multiple sides of learning from the office to the factory to the, college, to, the, to the family, to the training center, to the cyberspace, to the community, and also to the public square. The project itself, our project itself, is actually embedded in this idea of international network, of, of sharing uh, uh, good practice, sharing knowledge. The project itself actually involves actually going there involves talking to a, a range of uh, groups there, including students, employers, policymakers, ordinary people, going to the field, um, uh, hearing the stories of lifelong learning, if you like. And, and we, we, we had a big meeting in Amman, and we are constantly kind of going and coming uh, to, to, to Palestine. And the idea of, of the project to try to enhance the quality of lifelong learning in Palestine, to look at what is being available, what is being provided by higher education uh, institutions in Palestine, and to try to see whether we can learn from, as well as actually improve on the situation, and share it globally 
as well as uh, locally. And we are also we decided to prioritize certain groups in Palestinian societies, especially uh, to look at um, the urban poor, the rural countryside, groups of women, refugee camps. We kind of make, uh, made a conscious decision that we need to not just look at the provisions of life, life but also to look at how some marginalized group, uh, groups in society actually uh, faring. And also to try to explore the idea of actually having embedded sustainable strategy, long-term strategy, uh, and to try to make some policy recommendations uh, to local people as well as to the Europeans, Europeans funders, as well as internationally. There's something people actually haven't noticed. In the past three decades, we have really acquired revolution in higher education in Palestine. This is something people actually don't notice. <clears throat> uh, Palestinian universities in the last three decades have been, uh, uh, really have developed spectacularly in terms of numbers, in terms of what they're doing, in terms of the kind of centers they seem to be operating. They're not just centers of learning, they seem to be developing programs almost in every um, uh, aspect of life, from engineering, to medicine, to dentistry, to law, and you see these faculties actually emerging all the time. Uh, since I um, left Beers University, there were new and new faculties and, and, new, and new buildings actually going up. And that spectacular development, that quiet revolution, what I call, um, with no headlines, is something people um, uh, don't notice. Of course, uh, if you know something about Palestinian society, we have roughly about 11 million Palestinians in the world, and nearly 60 to 70 percent of all Palestinians are refugees. Refugees either abroad, either living in Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, in Chile, for instance, about 300,000 Palestinians living in Chile, Jordan, two and a half million. 60, 70 percent of the Palestinians are refugees. So inside the West Bank and Gaza, we have really a minority of Palestinians. At the same time, we have 23 university. Uh, universities and university colleges in the West Bank and Gaza. This is quite extraordinary. To have four, four and a half million Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza and to have 23 academic institutions for four million, four plus, this is very unusual. More than that, if you take the Gaza Strip, which is a tiny piece of land, always in the news, it, it has got 1.7 million Palestinians, 80% of them are refugees yet it has 10 universities and university colleges. 10 universities for about 1.7 million. Uh, I was actually talking to a Lithuanian friend, and he said, we, uh, we've got three universities for about 3 million Lithuanians, he said. I said, well, it's quite, you know, quite interesting to try to compare. So if you, if you have 23 universities for 4.5 million Palestinians, this could translate into something like 300 university and university colleges in the UK. Um, but uh, of course, there are problems uh, uh, with this situation. Um, also, we've got 1.2 million Palestinians in Israel who are bilingual, and they tend to study in Israel, in Israeli universities, not in the West Bank and Gaza. They are discouraged from studying in the West Bank and Gaza but we have a new phenomena of some of them going to study in Jordan. Very few people realize, actually, nearly 6,000 Palestinian citizens of Israel study in Jordan. This is a recent development after the Jordanian Israeli treaty. So they are actually, the Israelis are encouraging Palestinians in Israel to study in Jordan, but not to study with other Palestinians on the West Bank and Gaza. And, and of course, the Palestinians on the West Bank and Gaza are split between Gaza and the West Bank, which means if you live in Gaza, you can't study in the West Bank. You can't, you can't move physically and, and, and vice versa. So you've got this actually fragmented situation um, going on uh, for, the, for the Palestinians. Uh, Gaza also is a quite a, a spectacular place. It's got uh, 1.7 million people, 80% of them are refugees from what became Israel in 1948. 44% uh, uh, of them are under the age of 14. Only 3% of them are over the age of 65. 
So it's a very young population, but it's also a very poor population, really. I mean, the UN reports about poverty, malnutrition, about unemployment, nearly 60% unemployment in Gaza, yet it has 10 university and university colleges uh, running there. And uh, the Islamic University of Gaza have got nearly 25,000 students. Uh, so, so, so it's actually uh, uh, a mega university uh, in Gaza. And, and uh, 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 combined with uh, extreme poverty um, and malnutrition for the young, um, and, and of course we, we know the difficulties about learning when you are very poor. You can't concentrate and you can't learn properly. And I'll say something about Ashley Paolo Ferreira and his experience with, with poverty um, and um, how poverty can actually uh, affect learning. Um, the universities of Gaza are under the remit of Hamas, which won the Palestinian election in 2006. The universities of the West Bank are under the remit of the PA. So we have that sort of fragmentation between the West Bank and Gaza, um, which means we don't have a standardized way of, of um, if you like, imposing uh, higher education on the Palestinians. You've got kind of fragmented universities operating in different conditions. Um, and, of course, you've got the Palestinians in Israel, uh, basically um, another category of Palestinians who are not, kind of, if you like, studying with Palestinians as a whole. If we go back to 1948 and what I call the Nakba, the Palestinian catastrophe of 1948 and the creation of the Palestinian refugee problems, when Jerusalem was occupied, the Israelis took West Jerusalem and the Jordanians took East Jerusalem. And there was a famous college in Jerusalem called the Arab College, Al Kulli Al Arabiya. It was founded by the British in the 20s and it became a center of education, teacher training. It was the most important teacher training for Palestinians. It was really founded by the British, but the Palestinians took it over and they had a very famous um, uh, uh, principal there called Khalili Sekakini, who was a, 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 a very important educator. And that college educated generations of teachers, except it was closed in 1948. It was on the border between East Jerusalem and West Jerusalem, and the Jordanian authorities decided they didn't want to keep it on the border. So they closed it down, they gave the building to the UN, and it became the headquarters of the UN in Jerusalem. And after that, there was no uh, teacher training college on the West Bank. The Jordanians decided they want to emphasize Amman and Transjordan. They diverted all the resources to the, to the Transjordan area. The West Bank itself was downgraded. And between 1948 uh, uh, and 1967, practically we had no university in Palestine. That teacher training college, Al Kulil could have developed into a brilliant university. It has some of the best brains in it. And Palestinians, instead of actually staying on the West Bank, they went to study in Amman, in Beirut, in London, in Washington, and they ended up not coming back to the West Bank, but they ended up coming to the Gulf, and to Beirut, and to Amman. So you have the Palestinians basically setting up universities in the Gulf, and in, in Jordan, and setting up university centers and academic centers in Beirut, but not in Palestine. So we have that kind of dr brain drain, depletion of resources. A lot of Palestinians also went to America. Now, if you actually look at America, America has got the highest number of, Pal of Arab academics who are Palestinians. The best, or the, 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 the most influential Palestinians actually are living in America, they're intellectuals. Really, some of the top brains are living in America. Part of the same process of immigration, uh, nothing to keep you in, uh, no one is trying to encourage local development of, of, of uh, academic institutions, if you like. And of course, the middle class actually basically seek jobs and, and going. So we have actually, we as Palestinians, actually, we built up universities in the Arab world, and the Arab world kind of was kind of blessed with our kind of talent, if you like. But I think it was catastrophic for Palestine. And the closing of that Arab college was one of these kind of strategic decisions. The situation is beginning to change in the 70s and early, uh, early 70s when Palestinians are more restricted from going out. So you have, you have this movement of setting up universities in Palestine beginning in the 70s, Bethlehem University, uh, and you have local colleges which were um, secondary schools actually developing to universities in order to keep people inside. Really, the main purpose 
the, the, the beginning of this universe is just to keep people inside, to stop immigration, to keep people on, on, on to survive in, in Palestine. And this universe is gradually becoming um, huge institutions and becoming more and more professional, if you like. But I think the main objective of this university was just to keep people, to provide uh, opportunities for people to, to train locally and to keep, to keep people inside. So this was kind of um, uh, a primary objective and, and it did work. Uh, and today, in the last two decades, the number of students actually in, in, enrolling in the last 15 years has quadrupled, really. Quadruple. This is a spectacular development, if you like. Um, now we have nearly 150,000 Palestinian students studying inside Palestine. This includes uh, Open University of Al-Quds, which has got a, London, uh, a large number, but even our four partners, four Palestinian partners, four universities, actually, they've got between them about 50,000 uh, uh, students. And that, that revolution, that academic revolution, um, is not in the news. It's not celebrated, it's not mentioned, rarely mentioned. Of course, we have the conflict, continuing conflict going on, Israeli expansions um, and, and, and uh, Israeli settlement uh, expansions. Of course, um, the, 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 the wider context of living under occupation and developing universities under occupation has got to be uh, a framework uh, to, to consider things. In the last four and a half decades, we, we really had a dehumanizing occupation, dehumanizing at an almost individual level. The conditions of the Palestinians under Israeli occupation are well known. Uh, and the fracture of the Palestinian society and the fragmentation of higher education under Israeli occupation is, is also um, widely known. We have, um, we have Israeli settlements actually expanding, which means actually they fragment the Palestinian areas into pockets, if you like. And for students to travel from one city to another city, from one, uh, from one locality, from one town and village to their university, sometimes it's quite an ordeal. You have to dot a lot of checkpoints, you have to, so, so the reality of the walls and the barriers and the um, closures and the checkpoints, um, BZ University, when I was teaching there in the mid 90s, it was closed down on a regular basis by the Israelis. Before that, the Israelis deported the head of the university to Amman. Uh, so the guy was, he was trying to run BZ University from Amman. How could you run a university? I mean, you'd have to run, it's like running university in London from from, not from Paris, which you can, but I don't know, from Ecuador or Salvador, if you like. He actually spent 20 years trying to run a university from Amman, not from, from BZ itself. So they, he was the head of the university and he had deputies on the ground, but no one wanted to replace him. And a, a, a phenomenal figure. But the restrictions, the closures, I mean, some, when I told that, some of my students actually were, were actually on the run from the Israeli army. So they were sleeping in kind of, you know, everyone was sleeping in, in different places. So that, 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 that situation, it did sound crazy to me. Uh, and it's still unrealistic in terms of how people actually managed to get through these 600 checkpoints throughout the West Bank, just in order to get to campus. Some, sometimes you have to make a detour of two hours to get to the university. And of course, it's it just it crazy. Of course, so the, the, the whole idea of human rights, international law, has got to be central to this project. And you can't, you know, if you deny Palestinians um, much of their um, right to education, you deny uh, much of their humanity, talent, and creativities. Um, of course, the universities of Palestine cannot actually provide panacea for that conflict in Palestine. It would be wrong to think that the University of Palestine can actually somehow solve the conflict. The conflict is political, moral, uh, it's got to be uh, solved, uh, kind of, if you like, the solution has got to be. So we mustn't actually treat them as provided a panacea. Yet, against all odds, they have actually done quite a spectacular job. They continue to expand, flourish, develop new faculties, medicine, law, engineering, a whole range of things, actually, you can see them uh, across, actually, and being, uh, and being taught. And, and uh, they also, they have actually kept a lot of, also, they have attracted some academics from America back. Really, they began to reverse the trend of people moving out 
and began to bring people uh, back uh, inside. And also they began to work against the idea of fragmentation and isolation. You know, you fragment the houses into, if you like, pockets. And I think the universities actually are actually trying to overcome this. Um, and I think our project is uh, it's trying to create a network between them and trying to connect them together and tr to be able to overcome the reality of fragmentations under Israeli occupation. But I think they are a spectacular story of success. And this is something we need to mention and we need to um, uh, uh, celebrate. Uh, there's another story of, sec of success is the rise of uh, literacy in Palestine in the last 15 and, and 20 years. It has risen by about 10%. Um, I was also surprised by these statistics because when people talk about Palestine, they talk about intifadas, uprising, constant closures, not to be able to do things. But in fact, the literacy has been growing and has been rising, and it's quite spectacular among young female, among women. 98% of young women are uh, uh, literate. This is a spectacular success. It's actually slightly less among young males, about 96%. And the reason for that, because young males actually go out to work. And so <laughs> there's an advantage uh, going on. But this is another story of success in the last 15, 20 years. And I think the NGOs in Palestine, the explosion of NGOs in Palestine, have contributed to the rising literacy among men, uh, young men uh, and women and to stop people actually dropping out. So this is actually another story of, if you like, um, spectacular success. Now, I want to move on very quickly to talk about Freire and Edward Said. Uh, and um, uh, Freire was a Brazilian liberation theologian, um, um, a Catholic uh, liberation theologian, and he was a teacher by profession. He was rooted in the Catholic um, uh, um, a tradition of social teaching and what I call also Catholic humanism. Also, he was influenced by many other things, including the Second Vatican, including liberation theology in Latin America, including the rise of the indigenous uh, voice in Latin America. Said was a secular, secular humanist, really. He kept reminding everyone that he's secular, a humanist. And Said was inf influenced by many traditions. Um, but he kept saying he's a Palestinian Christian uh, with an Arab Muslim identity. Um, he kept reminding people about this multiplicity of identity, that he actually belongs to Palestinian, but also an American. He's a Palestinian Christian, but also he's, a, he's, he's born and brought up in that uh, Arab Islamic traditions. Said, um, uh, uh, of course, wasn't uh, essentialist about identity. And he thought, you know, we all have multiple identities. Both guys were also optimistic about human nature. And this is something uh, important to mention about um, uh, <coughs> their approaches. Both, they had distinct approaches to education. Um, Said was an intellectual, an academic. He published Orientalism, which was translated into about 50, 50 languages, if you like. And he became, he became a celebrity after that, 1978. He became uh, very much in demand. When he came to London, he got about 500 people trying to cram into the hall, trying to see him. Much, much, much more famous than uh, Noam Chomsky, if you like. But um, uh, um, Said and Freire, um, emphasize different things. Uh, I think Freire's uh, book, Pedagogies of the Oppressed, is probably the most important, actually, book to be written about adult education in the last, maybe, half a century. And the book itself became an a, a iconic book for American teaching training colleges in America, perhaps even more than in Latin America. Even in America, his book, uh, Pedagogies of the Oppressed, published in 1968, uh, translated into English in 1970, translated into something like 50 languages. It became his, his trademark. Many of his ideas were not very original, but they popularized adult education, popular education, student center approaches to education. He, he also emphasized the practice, or the praxis, what he called, uh, like liberation theologians, not just the theory, you need both. He, he, uh, he emphasized engagement with the realities of, um, 
of uh, inequalities in Latin America, going to the slum, working with the poor. Um, <coughs> I, think, I think the context of uh, Freire, Said, is about the whole question of engagement. And uh, to take you back to The Prince of Machiavelli, written kind of 500 years ago, Machiavelli thought it, education should be uh, not immoral and not moral, he called it amoral, basically neutrally moral, what we call a techn te technocratic education. We really need, need to educate the ruler to be more technocratic, if you like. It's got nothing to do with morality or immorality. We, I think uh, Machiavelli has misunderstood. People think he actually encouraged debauchery and immorality and this and that. He really wanted to separate morality from education, from politics. And this notion that education can somehow can be morally neutral, this is um, central to his idea. And today we can actually see it in the rational, if you like, realistic approach to education. Um, now, to bring you back to Earth and to the Palestinian situation and to current Palestinian Prime Minister uh, <coughs> uh, Salam Fayyad. Salam Fayyad did his PhD at the University of Austin in Texas and he did it in economics. And then he went to work for the International Monetary Fund and then he went to teach for a university in Jordan. So he became an academic, but also he was a, an ex-official of the International Monetary Fund, really an, a, an economist by education. And then he was brought in to Palestine by Mahmoud Abbas to form a te technocratic government with a certain amount of achievements. Now, Fayyad really does embody that technocratic approach. I mean, I'm, I'm not dismissing him. I'm not saying he's wrong. But he, his approach is well known to Palestinians and local Palestinians and to try to separate completely education from politics. And to, now, the whole approach of the Palestinians since 1940 to try to combine both, if you like, professional as well as being engaged with their society. But also we have, um, we have Palestinian in refugee camps basically acquiring skills, becoming engineers becoming doctors in order to escape poverty. So the whole idea of having occupation, a profession, okay, can, can I? <laughs> I, I think we shouldn't actually misunderestimate, to quote George Bush actually, the idea of professional development. Uh, I think Palestinians, because they were a refugee society, professionalism, Law, medicine was actually very popular among them. In order to get out of poverty, you know, in order to get out of the refugee camps, you acquire education. So education was incredibly important in terms of pulling out of poverty. And I think we mustn't actually underestimate this approach to education in terms of self-improvement, in terms of professionalizing, in terms of one way to get out of your desperate situation is to become a lawyer, become an engineer. And we have really um, uh, uh, spectacularly um, uh, uh, mobility among refugees because of that professional development. But I think the idea of trying to separate education from morality and from engagement with the situation and um, the reality of the uh, Palestinians, you know, this notion that education can be completely uh, amoral, if you like, is, is very problematic. And I think Said and and Freire recognized that. You can't really divorce adult education from the social, political, moral, and, and, and the socioeconomics, if you like. So I think this notion that <coughs> um, education should be just one thing is quite uh, a, a problematic idea. Education about many things. And I, I want to go back to Edward Said um, and to, to try to uh, conceptualize his idea. Edward Said lived most of his life in exile. He came from West Jerusalem and his ha house was taken over by the Israeli authorities. And initially the Israeli authorities actually gave it to Christian, a Christian fundamentalist group. Uh, but we know the house and I went to have a, a look at it there. And uh, the house is occupied by another occupant now. The um, uh, International Christian Embassy in Jerusalem moved to another much posher Arab house in Jerusalem. In, uh, this one, um, it, 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 uh, it belongs to a, a Palestinian Christian refugee uh, from the Katamon neighborhood of Jerusalem. 
But you, you can see there's also a spectacular house that should be in the 20s, one of these sort of uh, palatial houses. So they, they gave up on the house of Edward VIII, which was fairly modest um, for them. But Edward lived most of his life in New York, and exile was part of his life, physical exile part of his life. But I think Edward VIII was one of those people who tried to re reconfigure exile in terms of mental exile and intellectual exile and spiritual exile. And he came up with the idea of exile being basically a state of mind, almost kind of uh, central to, to uh, uh, the human condition here. And, and, and I think Edward um, came up with uh, the idea of um, what he called contrapuntal um, uh, uh, notion. He, Edward actually played piano, and he played extremely well piano. And he thought in piano, you end up actually with different voices there, but you don't need to harmonize them. So he came up with the idea that you can actually take um, uh, contrapuntal music, different voices in piano, and you could actually apply it to different voices in society uh, uh, and give, give people different voices. You don't need to, you don't need to, as an academic, as a scholar, you don't need to homogenize everything. You don't need to harmonize everything. You don't need to speak for people. Edward thought you really don't need to speak for people as an academic. What do you do as an academic? You, you speak of people, you don't speak for people. You allow people to speak for themselves. And you, you have a range of voices. When you explore, uh, when you interview people, when you explore society, you allow a range of voices to emerge. You don't have to impose a particular point of view. As an academic, you don't have to be too much representative, if you like. You don't have to be representative of power. You talk about people, you talk of people, but you don't speak for people. That's a difficult thing to do. I.e., as an academic, you remain more or less as a critic, as a moral critic. You can transform society as a moral critic. You don't have to be pretending to represent everyone. You don't have to impose authority intellectual authority on people. You allow a range of voices to emerge, and you can, you can talk about people uh, as a, a, a range of it. You don't speak for people. You don't represent people in terms of authority. You, you, you represent their conditions, their suffering, their, their situation. But you don't speak for people. You speak of people. You don't harmonize voices. You don't impose a single authority. You, you keep multiple voices. You encourage people to speak for themselves. This, I think this is actually central to uh, education, higher education. This notion of the need not to harmonize everything, but to allow people to, to allow voices actually to emerge. Um, and I think this is actually relevant to the context of uh, Palestine and the Palestinians. Again, to go back to Freire and Said, both were prophetic in their positive tradition. You know, this notion that the prophets actually speak on behalf of God. I say it didn't buy this idea, but I think prophetic in, in telling truth, speaking truth to power, if you like. Um, the intellectual, uh, <coughs> he, he's not there to represent power and authority, and to, to, he's there to, 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 to reflect reality, if you like. He's there as a, a critique of, of, of um, uh, society. He's there. He can you can transform society from being a moral critic. You don't have to be the authority. You don't have to be too much uh, claiming representative power, if you like. And, and, and I think Said also um, came up with this idea of the academic both being, um, if you like, detach and engage. I think we have a tendency actually to construct actually detach and engage in a kind of um, if you like, abstract way. We have a, te a tendency to, for a binary way of thinking. We think uh, feminine qualities somehow are opposite to masculine qualities. We construct binaries and we think binaries represent reality. We think academics should be detached or engage. These are abstract binaries. In fact, in reality, they don't really uh, they don't work. In reality, you can really, you can be engaged as well as detach. And I say, uh, Said came up with this idea, again, it comes from this idea of exile. I, I, intellectual, uh, if you like, endeavor is about journey out and journey back in, if you like. It's a journey out and in, i.e. journey out to the outside, but also journey back to the center, journey out from the self-reference, if you like, to the 
outer, but then journey back to the center if you want to influence things, if you want to be part of the debate, if you want to influence the public square. In and out is fundamentally what, what we do in, in education and in academic life. Is not being detached completely, is not being engaged completely. Is this notion of detach and engage. Detach, basically, to be able to see things from the outside, engage to be more passionate, to want to change, to have a moral voice, to be part of it, to, to want to... So this notion of being detached and engaged, I think we need to uh, kind of... Uh, 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 kind of uh, reconfigure it and to try to uh, uh, put it back into, if you like, in, in education. Education is about being professional but also being passionate, being caring. Being professional is being able to look at things from the outside, being competent. Edward also came up with this idea of being professional uh, but also being amateur. And he didn't really mean to be amateur is to be dilettante, is not to be unprofessional, but to, be, to do it because of the love of it, if you like. It's, it's a bit like actually uh, um, uh, amateur, amateur sports, if you like. You do things not just as a professional, but you do things because you love it. I think creation comes from this idea of being passionate about it, doing it for the love of it, if you like. Not just being professional, uh, skilled, competent, uh, excellent, but also want to do it because you really enjoy doing it. You know, Glenn enjoys work, working on Henry VIII. He really loves it. That creativity is essential to the way we do things. And I think this, this kind of artificial binary between kind of detach, if you like, and being, being engaged, wanting to have a say, um, wanting to be part of the debate, try to uh, have a moral voice, critique. These two things are not um, dichotomous. They're not contradictory. They're not binary. The binary is actually in our head. They're not actually in reality. In reality, we can be both detached, professional, as well as passionate about the moral side of it, about the ethical side of it. And I think we can't really, here we can't separate education from ethics. And this is, um, this is something which I actually learned from Edward Said. To be passionate, but to be, not to be kind of narrow-minded in terms of expertise. To be detached and engaged at the same time. It, it, what makes us less egoistic? Um, to be passionate and, and to be engaged is actually what opens up things. It doesn't close down things. Uh, and, and I think this is actually central to also the whole idea of education. Education in Arabic is actually terrible. It's about bringing up, it's about um, incubating, it's about nurturing, it's about actually things from the ground up, if you like. And I think it's Arabic in Arabic. And to educate, you know, that word education, which is kind of English Latin, if you like, is about actually nurturing things from, from the bottom, from the ground up. This is another idea which I took from Freire, the notion of bringing up, if you like, that's education uh, for you, from the, for, from the ground up. And of course, Freire and liberation theologians went to the base communities and went to the slums, and wanted, they wanted to learn from the slums also, not just to bring into the slums, but they wanted to learn from ordinary people. So this notion of, of from the ground up also could be relevant to the way we could develop um, higher education in, in Palestine. I mean, both, both also gives you kind of more a holistic approach to education. I think both, both Edward and Freire were genius, but not elitist, you know. Sometimes I notice Leicester University says we are elite, but not elitist, if you like. You know, you can be highly professional, but not elitist in the political elitism, if you like. You can still be um, uh, from the ground uh, up. In what way all this stuff actually relevant to higher education in Palestine? Of course, we have the... Uh, Palestinian authorities set up in Ramallah. We have a lot of the donor aids actually going to Ramallah. Thousands of NGOs are operating from Ramallah. A lot of the resources are being diverted from the periphery, from the poor um, peripheries in Palestine, from Gaza into, if you like, the capital, into the middle classes. And I think there, there is something good about Palestinian um, uh, uh, NGOs and what they do, but also you divert resources actually to uh, uh, you centralize it, you give it to uh, a small number of people actually operating from Ramallah, instead of actually looking at what's happening across the country, if you like. I mean, how do you move resources from the, from the elite, from the center, from the middle classes, from the universities, uh, which are close to, if you like, Ramallah, to, uh, to across the, 
uh, across Palestine, this is actually a major challenge for Palestinian higher education um, and for developing community uh, project. Now, what we have been doing, um, we've been through the first stage of <coughs> benchmarking. We have uh, just concluding the benchmarking. What we did, we went out there and uh, people interviewed a lot of people. They heard stories and we're doing the benchmarking, but the way we are doing the benchmarking, which is benchmarking is about excellence, isn't it? We agree on that, don't we? It's about the good practice. It's about the best thing, actually. So what we, the way we try to understand, actually, the reality of the uh, Palestinians, actually, what is the best thing about Birzeit University? What is the best thing about Bethlehem University? What exactly the Islamic University in Gaza are doing best? And I think we try to come up with some sort of bench, benchmarking from within by interviewing people, by looking at the pockets of excellence uh, throughout, and by not trying to homogenize things. And I think we came to, um, we, we have just concluded the benchmarking, but we don't have the official report. I have kind of, kind of oral report about the, the benchmarking. And we came to the conclusion that different universities are different, different things. Um, and they are good at certain things. Depend, depend on actually who is running the university. And, um, uh, 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 and the history of the university. Bethlehem University was created by the LaSalle brothers. Uh, they, they're largely based in America, and, and they are, uh, it's a small university, but highly dedicated. And the LaSalle brothers decided that small business is an important thing actually for the university. So they have really some excellent projects actually which promote, they call them incubation, promote setting up businesses, going to the community and setting up businesses. Maybe they are, if you like, Obama-type influences going on there. Maybe there is kind of influence, but I think they actually, we, are, we have discovered through the benchmarking that some of their projects are actually worth actually listening to. BSA University is, the old, is one of the oldest, most powerful universities. It probably is the uh, most developed uh, university on the West Bank. It's got 93 projects across the West Bank. I mean, this is quite an extraordinary thing to, for a single university in the UK to have 93 projects across the UK. And a lot of them are with some with Jenin, the other end of the West Bank, some with uh, <coughs> El Khalil, Hebron, really 93 projects, running 93 projects, which means a lot of funding going out. A lot of them are to do with small farmers, to do with women um, in, in refugee camps. But to be able to uh, have 93 uh, projects with the community, this is also an achievement. So we are trying to assess which one is working and how you could replicate some of these ideas, how you take an idea done, tested, working for BZ University and take it to the University of Gaza. So really we are trying to come up with a benchmarking <coughs> way of looking at the nuggets of excellence in Palestine and trying to replicate them. Not try to impose on Palestine a single standard, not try to impose benchmarking from above, but to look at benchmarking as growing up from below, as kind of unifying, as linking up these communities, as, as overcoming their situation fragmentations, and also bringing the Palestinian partners together. Sometimes they can't meet. They can't meet on the West Bank, so we meet in Amman sometimes. Uh, we meet through video conferencing. But I think this idea of them sharing knowledge about their situations and their universities um, and, and, and replicating some of the excellent work they are doing. So you, you, this way you, you, you grow up projects throughout the country. And I think um, <coughs> we have, um, uh, con we have um, uh, uh, concluded the best part of this year in terms of benchmarking, in terms of looking at excellence, in terms of having a good picture about, I had, I mean, I actually taught to a BZ university, and I, I mean, in and out of the place, but I had no idea about what each one is doing, what exactly the university, the Islamic University of Gaza is doing, in what area it's good. I mean, one of the problems of the Islamic University of Gaza has got hundreds of projects, but they are more aspirational, they're more ambitious activities, if you like, when you look at them, of course, the restriction, the siege, uh, the fact that people can't move in and out easily, it's a, it's, it's a problem of um, restricting the uh, kind of attainment of these objectives. Um, so, so, but I think we are <coughs> there in terms of mapping out, in terms of benchmarking, and in terms of also 
beginning to make recommendations, if you like, in the next stage. And I think this is actually one way to grow things from below, what we call one way to share knowledge. Their international partners, uh, the European partners, are not coming to impose things on Palestine. They're coming to share their own experience. So there's a lot of learning for them in it. And also we can learn from each other when you have 10 partners and the knowledge sharing. And the whole idea of knowledge sharing, this is actually a publicly funded project by the Europeans. So you've got to share it and you've got to share it freely, by the way. Uh, this is an important thing. But I think uh, we have moved from the idea of a quiet revolution maybe into something which we, we, we might call an Arab Spring in Palestinian universities, academic spring. The idea is very familiar to people here. They seem to be kind of using it all the time. So I'm actually using this cliche about how you can create an academic spring through replicating excellence across the country. And, and, um, and at this point, um, thank you for being good listeners. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.